First guest tonight has his own place in its story. Along with his brother, he formed a band, Oasis, which changed the musical landscape of the 90s. Their songs became the anthems of a generation. They also lived a lifestyle which embraced the extremes of drugs, sex, and rock and roll. They survived long enough to celebrate album sales of 50 million and to make a best of album called Stop the Clocks. Ladies and gentlemen, Noel Gallagher. <laughs> You're at the best of stage at your career now. That's a landmark, isn't it? Yeah, before I'm 40 as well, it's not bad going, that, is it? That's all right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah and you also had news today that you've got an uh, outstanding achievement award at next year's Brits. Greatest living human being of all time. That's right, you. that's the next <laughs> award. Then the yeah. knighthood. Yeah, oh, no, I wouldn't go for it. Oh, I don't no, know about no, that. No, no, then no, the no. story would be absolutely complete, wouldn't no, it? No, I don't think so. Eh? I don't think so, no. But I think, we get, I think we're getting a gong at the Brits for the, you know... Lifetime achievement thing. Yeah. That's right. Well, yeah, that's, that's should be good, good night. Yeah. yeah. And when, we'll talk about you know how you got there because it's a fascinating story. But but what about this this album? I mean, it's it's called Stop the Clocks. Does that yeah. mean that you're finished now with the Oasis? Or no, what? no. It's it's a kind of um, we, we we only got back off our tour in March uh, March of this year, which is only about six months ago, and we were not we weren't going to re-sign with our record label Sony. So they own all the rights to all the music anyway. So we got wind that they were going to do this, and it was kind of like well. We've been on a big long world tour. We might as well take the year off, make some more cash. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you choose from all the songs that you've written? Because there's quite um, a catalogue there, isn't there? It's well, a I double CD, I should say. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, I drew up a list of about 30. I think it was 33. But that would have made that would have made it three CDs. Mm. And I think that's kind of overstating the point a bit. Because Bob, Dil well, yeah, because Bob Dylan's only got two CDs <laughs> in his best of. <laughs> <laughs> the Beatles have only got two in there, so I think three would have been stretching it a bit. And what, what input did, did Brother Liam have in this? He just looked down the list to see where his song was. <laughs> and, uh, and, that and he just went, yeah, whatever. All right. And what, what, to, what, what are the relations like between you and him at present? Um, <clears throat> they're all right, you know. What all does right. all right mean? Uh, <laughs> so I find it fascinating that people find it fascinating, do you know what I mean? It, I haven't spoken to him for a few months but not like I'm not actively not speaking to him it's just that we kind of live in each other's pockets while we're on the road and uh, I kind of just slip back into life when I get back off the road and Liam does this thing and I do mine you know? well most people think that well, it's deep, deeper than that isn't it there's all the well publicized spats that you have and the quotes about not liking each other and that sort of thing yeah well he doesn't he doesn't like me he doesn't no why doesn't he like you? Well, I don't know. You'd have to ask him next time he's on here, wouldn't Come you? Come on, you know. I don't, well, I don't, I don't, I, well, because I'm better looking than him, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, has it always been like that? Was it, was it when you were growing up as kids in, in Manchester, was it like that? Well, because he was, he was five years younger than I, than I am. So, when, when I was 15, he was 10. So, the, so the age gap was kind of more prevalent then than it is now. But, um, <clears throat> I guess because... There is a lot of pressure being in, 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 in a group, particularly being in a big group, you know. And um, we kind of fall out on a regular basis. But it's not, it's not anything that's ever put the band in danger. The only people that suffer, really, are the other, whoever happens to be in the band at that point, you know, is the other people in the band. You know, there's been hundreds of them in the past. But do, do, do you wish that could, you could define that brotherly love as it's really generally defined? You know? Well, shoulder I could define, let, let's put it this way. If he was getting his head kicked in right now, right, <laughs> I'd probably join in to save him. Right? If I was getting my head, he'd probably join in to save me. I can't say any fairer than that. No, you can't. So we'll have to wait until it happens. Yeah, but other, other, than, other, other than that, it'd be kind of, you know, I'd be... If you're making it somewhere that it's not, you know, I mean, I, 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 do, you, do, you have, do, you, do you have a brother or brothers and sisters? I don't, don't you see, this, this interests me. I've always wanted a brother or a sister, and I thought, I you always know, wanted a sister, you see. Yeah. An older sister would have been nice. Just to cop off with the mates would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you like women, don't you? Because, I mean, you, your mum was your kind of beacon in your life. Yeah, yeah. Well, my mum was just a... Uh, well, she brought us up, really, do you know what I mean? Exactly, because, I mean, the, what's, what you pick up in research when you talk about your, your upbringing, you, you say, you talk about the friction with Liam, and you say it had something to do, maybe, with the way you were brought up. I think, yeah, I think so. I think maybe, because I, I, I kind of... How can I put it? 
We don't like authority figures very much, me and Liam. And I guess because everybody in the band kind of directs everything towards me because I am, for want of a better word, kind of seen as the leader. I think Liam rebels against that, you know right. what I mean? Right. And that kind of causes friction between us, but... You know, growing up was, was different, you know, it was, we were like... We shared a bedroom, which I always resented that. Because my older brother got his own bedroom. And I had to share it with Liam when he came along. I've never quite forgiven him for that. But I mean... <laughs> But also, too, I mean, it, there was violence in your family, wasn't there? Your father was a violent well, man. Well, yeah. No, I, saying that, I thought, I, not, not any more than probably any other of my mate's families on our street, do you know what I mean? But that wouldn't be saying much, would it? Because, I mean, you grew up in a very tough neighbourhood. Yeah, but it was the 70s, and this was before the New Age man was, you know, the trendy thing to be, do you know what I mean? There was, like, it was a violent time in the 70s anyway, do you know what I mean? Well, there's um, even been change, not changing nappies, your dad, and beating you up, for God's sake. I and mean, that's what he used to do. <laughs> he used to beat you. Yeah, he did, yeah. But, you uh, know. On, on, and you used to lie awake at night, waiting in your bed, and thinking, is he going to come in and whack me? Yeah. And, and you developed a stammer because of that? Yeah. Where well, did you know all this? <laughs> Yeah, see, and what really interests me is that people nowadays talk about sink estates and they talk about youth and they talk about the problems they have. But, I mean, you lived all that. Yeah. And you lived at a time when, when people were not as concerned, maybe, as they are now, mm. at the very beginning of, of, of all that. And, and, and what fascinates me is, is how a kid with no hope and no future grows up. I mean, <coughs> what was it like? I, I remember being young and the, the worst part for me was not i don't consider my upbringing to be that different than anybody else that lived on my street or any of the yes. other or any of the other the other guys that i used to knock around with who are my age but it is kind of soul destroying or it was in the 80s when you're going to sign on with your dad with your best mate and his dad and you think you know our dads are, haven't even got jobs you know so what hope is there for us do you know what i mean so that in itself breeds <sighs> frustration and non-hope, I guess, do you know what I mean? Yes. But it's never, none of that has ever come out in my music, do you know what I mean? And my music has always been kind of pretty positive, you know, and I've always been fascinated by life, you know, that, I don't want to sound too, um, that's weird about it, but like every day I wake, I wake up, you know, it was like, it was great because something great might happen today. It wasn't kind of like, I wouldn't wake up in a negative mood any day, and I never do, you know. But, um, those were kind of rough times when there was no work in Manchester. Yes. You know, for not, not, not only for your age group, but for, you know, your parents at all, you know. And was, drugs uh, were around. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And you got stuck into them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the difference between the middle classes and the working classes. The, the middle classes experiment with drugs. The working class just get stuck in. Like, <laughs> <don't they? laughs> forget experimenting with them. Let's just get them done. So by the time you became a rock and roller, you were very well practised in the art of... Well, this is what, you know, you read, you read all these stories now about uh, these rock stars going into rehab, and, you know, somebody must take them aside at some point and say, look, I think you're going off the rails, you know, you might want to go to the Priory or somewhere. We were off the rails to start with. We were off the rails before we got... <laughs> before we got a record deal. Before Temptation came yeah. your way. I mean, yeah. we, we kind of arrived in London hammered, just out of it. Just like, <laughs> come on, let's have it, do you know what I mean? And um, so it's never been a problem for... It's never been a problem for me and Liam, and it fascinates me that all, out of all the people that we hung out with, the only two people that have never been in rehab is me and Liam. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. And why have you resisted that? I mean, what, well, I, I, I kind of... Pass I mean, we are clean now, we used to say that. You, you... Yeah, well, I, I, see, I don't like that term either, because I'd never considered myself to be dirty, do you know what I mean? I took... <laughs> well, well, you're, free of, you're free of drugs? Y yeah. Yeah, you're not having, what, what, eight years now, is it? Eight and a half. Eight yeah. and a half years. But, that, but I, you know, when you, you kind of say that to people, then you kind of half expect a round of applause, but I don't think that, you know, there should be anything like that, because where we come from in Manchester, that was just the done thing, do you know what I mean? And I've, I've, never, I've never had a problem with it. The only, the, only, the only thing that is bad about drugs is it makes you drink more. And that eventually messes you up, I think. But my, my, I, I, if there was gold medals for taking drugs for England, I'd have won a shitload. <laughs> right? And I enjoyed it, but it was kind of got to the point where I'd, just, I'd done them all, and that was it, and there was none left. And I was like, well, I can't be arsed anymore. <laughs> but there was a moment, wasn't there, when you actually, there was a, 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 a physical moment when you thought, no. Yeah, I mean, how it's, been, how it's been portrayed in the past is kind of I stood up at a party and went, and this shall be my last line, <laughs> right? And after this, there will be no more. You know, it was kind of, we were at a party one night, and it was just, 
I got up one day and I thought, I can't be bothered today. And then one day turned into a week, and that turned into a month, and then that turned into a year. And then I kind of just enjoyed not being out of it all the time. And then as that kind of, as that kind of state of mind took hold, I'd kind of go out with the people who I was surrounded with at the time, and you're sitting there thinking, I don't really like you. Your bird's an idiot, you know. <laughs> what are you doing in my front room? And in the end, it's kind of, everybody just kind of left the party, if you like, and was just left to get on with life, I guess. Is it a struggle, though? I mean, do you have to reorganise your, your life, not to go to the old haunts and meet those old people not really. again? It isn't. Not really. I mean, there's no, there's no temptation there. You've got, you've got to be strong-willed anyway, right, to say... And vanity plays a big part in my life, you know what I mean? Oh, how my teeth were falling out and all sorts, you know what I mean? And kind of, nobody wants to look like a weirdo, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, in the beginning, I don't want this to sound like my drugs, hell, because it wasn't hell. It was fantastic. I had some of the most monumental nights out ever. And monumental nights in wrote some of the best songs, met some of the greatest people in some of the greatest parties, man. And, um, <laughs> but there just came a point where it's like, I can't be bothered anymore. And, but, but what about the... That, that's an interesting point. You say you reckon you wrote some of your best stuff. Yeah. Mind you, you, you wrote some of your best stuff, of course, when you were in Manchester, didn't you? On the, yeah. In the Dole as well, I mean, yeah. before you became a... So that's an interesting point, isn't it? That you were writing these songs when you weren't actually a professional musician. Well, I'd written, I'd written all the first... I'd written all the first album, all the lyrics and all the music before I got a record It was on the Dole. The yeah. second album was already started before I had a record deal. I finished that off. The third album was probably basically written about two years before it came out. So I, 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 was, a, I was prolific in my youth, do you know what I mean? Because I had plenty of time on my hands. Yes. But, what, but what happens when you kind of, you, you get into it and you get, you get kind of older, you get more baggage, do you know what I mean? The more baggage that you get, the less time you have. I mean, when I was 24, I had a guitar and a pair of Adidas trainers and 20 Bensons and that was it, and that was all I cared about. You know, so I had time on my hands to write music, you know. But as life gets on, you get kids and all that carry on, do you know what I mean? And you get married and then you get divorced and blah, blah, blah and all that. You kind of, you don't, you don't, you don't have the time to devote, you know, to uh, music. And there's football and all sorts to be getting involved <laughs> Exactly, awesome. And the TV is brilliant these days, do you know what I mean? Uh, and, and what about, I mean, that, on that transition from, I mean, the, the thing about, about your success was that, you know, people always say they're an overnight success. Well, that's not true either. No. I mean, you're three years touring around, weren't you? I mean, without a record deal, just... We started, the band in, in, we started the band at the beginning of 91 and we got a record, the first single come out in 94, we got a record deal at the end of 93. So we were a good, good three years in the back of the transit van doing the, doing the toilets, which were the best times, you know. Yeah. They were brilliant. Yeah, that apprenticeship's invaluable, I imagine. Yeah, because you're in it for the right reasons then, do you know what I mean? You're in it for the... I mean, I'm not saying that any of us are in it for any other reasons than the music now, but, but for then, it was just the love of doing it, do you know yes, what I mean? Yes. Of... of, of Saying, when people used to come up, uh, when we were out in Manchester, they'd say, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm a rock and roll star. And they'd go, who I have never heard of you. I'm like, well, I play guitar for a living. That makes me a rock and roll star. It doesn't matter if you've never seen me on top of the pops. We'll get to that in a few years. <laughs> so, in fact, you never really dreamt of, of it when you were in that dull queue. It just kind of crept up on you in a sense. Well, I'd always been interested in music, yeah. right? And I'd always been interested in listening to music. And there was a, and there was a guitar in our house. And I was kind of... I learned, I taught myself how to play that. And I was fascinated by Top of the Pops and rock stars like Mark Boland and David Bowie and, and, the, and the flamboyancy of these, you know, these people that seem to live in a different world, you know. And rock stars never came from Manchester. They came to Manchester and done gigs and then they got off. But nobody ever, and then, and then kind of like the Smiths and New Order and the, and the Manchester scene mm. kind of started. And, um, you know, it was fascinating, and I got a job as a roadie for a band called Inspiral Carpets. And I'd already travelled the world probably twice before I joined Oasis, and I'd seen, you know, I'd been to Russia and South America and Japan mm. and, and, and America. So I'd kind of seen it all and done it, you know. And by the time I, I, was, I was on tour once, and I called my mum, and uh, I said, where's Liam? And she said, he's rehearsing. What? <laughs> what for? Has he been caught or something? You know, and she said, no, he's, he's, no, he's rehearsing, he's, he, he's in a band. And I was like, he's in a band? And then she said, he's the singer. And I was like, he's the singer in a band? It's like, it must be diabolical. And uh, so he kind of got back and Liam asked us to come and see him rehearse. And he actually asked me to be their manager, right? Now, if you think our relationship is bad now of being in the band, can you imagine what it would have been like if I was their manager? <laughs> and have you ever thought of reconciliation with your dad at all? No, I've not, I, but I, that kind of, I don't, 
have any bad feelings towards him for what happened. Do you know what I mean? You don't. I, no, I don't, because it's not shaped the psyche of who I am. You know, it's never. I've never once sat down and thought, right, you know, I'm going to write a song about my childhood. Do you know what I mean? Because who wants to listen to that nonsense anyway? It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't play any part in my makeup. And I get asked about, you know, journalists all the time. Well, it must do, and it must do. And I say to them, well, I can invent some kind of angst if you want, but I'd be lying. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like I wouldn't dwell on that part of my life at all. To me, it's just. It's just was just growing up, you know, and growing up. Although we had no money or anything like that, you know, we didn't even have carpet on the floors in our house. My mum will hate me for saying that, but there you go, sorry, man. But um, <laughs> when I look back on it, it was great because it kind of the the kind of not not the thing with my dad, but the struggle of being on the doll. It kind of makes you who you are. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It makes you self-sufficient. That's what it means. Yeah. So you don't need the priory or any of that stuff. No, the priory. <laughs> <laughs> why would why why would you take into an hospital to pay somebody four grand an hour to tell you things that really you should already know about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> it's got common sense, isn't you know it? I mean? yeah. If any of you are watching, give me the money. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sort it out for you. All the best just... with the all the best with the album. Well, thank you very it's much. It's a reminder of some of the marvelous songs that you have written. In oh, they are with... really very good, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and you continue to do so, Noel Gallagher. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you. guest is simply a Hollywood legend, one of the superstars of the film industry and one of its great character actors. As he approaches his 70th birthday, he can look back on a glittering career, including two Oscars and a Lifetime Achievement Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Dustin Hoffman. You believe it's 30 years since we last met. Were you born in 1979? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm actually 39. I oh, know I don't look it, but I am. So you were nine years old was, when... Yeah, when, when you two first met. Did I remember it well, actually. <laughs> you, watched, you watched the show? I did. Thank you. What? Let's, before we talk about your new movie, yes, let's, let's, I mean, when you look at your career, it's an extraordinary range of roles that you've played. I mean, nobody's played a greater range of roles than you. Um, is there anything that's, uh, that's eluded you? Any part that you wanted that you've not yet played? James Bond. James Bond? <laughs> Why James Bond? Because I don't think he's ever been played correctly. What's missing? Well, when you get a part and you're an actor, you look at the frame of the, de you know, the, 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 the part is defined and you're supposed to play what it says it is. And no one's ever played him for what he is. Well, how would you play him? He's an assassin. Yes. He'll kill anybody that he's told to kill. He doesn't care who it is. He'll screw any girl jumping off the curb. <laughs> he's a womanizer. <laughs> he doesn't really like women, you know? He bangs them once and that's it. You know? Sounds like my brother. <laughs> <laughs> and if so, I got the part, I'd want to be a brother <laughs> and observe him. Right, let's talk, let's, talk about, right. let's talk about your new movie, Strangely Fiction. I mean, this is, you play a professor in this. It's an interesting premise. Will Ferrell plays a guy who's living a life, but he keeps hearing this is life being told uh, by a, a woman who's writing a, a mystery story. And the inevitable consequence of this story is it goes through his head. He knows it's going to end in his death. So he goes to you to try and find out what the hell is happening and what he can do about it. I mean, it, the film deals on, on a level that we do have, we're living two lives. In other words, everyone has a writer inside them. We live one life from day to day, and then there's a voice inside of us, each of us, that is saying, why don't you do this? Why, why don't you do that? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? There's, and we don't. We, and at a later point, we, reg we regret that other person that was telling us, I didn't, why didn't you live your own life? And I think it astounds all of us that we don't live more our, 
our own life. So well, you don't listen to that no, voice at well, all? Oh, totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's listened to that voice. He can't have too many regrets. There's not too many things that you've not done, is it? No. That voice, no. no. Well, live your own life and other people's if you can help it. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been cautious about that, then, haven't you? About listening to that voice, that other voice saying, why don't you do that? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Well, I've, uh, in, in my, me personally, yeah. I, I don't, I find it hard to believe people who said, you know, I don't regret anything I've ever done, and if I had life to live over, I wouldn't change anything. Yes. I would change about 95%. Well, I really think it's, you know, the, they say life isn't a dress rehearsal. It is. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> you know? And I wish I could go back. I, I just, give me my 20s back, give me my 30s back. Knowing what I know now, I think I could live it more fully. What would I you just fundamentally do? change? Would you fundamentally change the films you made? Oh, I'd take a lot of films that I'd turn down, yeah. Would you? Yeah. And what about the films that you had success with? What do you do with them? Would you like to re-edit your life to that extent? Yeah. I mean, I don't know what it's like for Mr. Gallagher, but I know that, I mean, when you, you know, you do your work, you put out mm. your, 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 your albums, and then at a later point, you'll hear it. Yeah. Well, with me, and I know actors like me, let's say we, we'd make films and we see it when it opens, and if it's funny, maybe you'll go back while it's playing and stand on the back and hear the laughs hit. It's a nice feeling. But then years pass, and you're watching television, and, you, and you, you're surfing along, and there's one of your movies. Mm -hmm. And I, personally, I'll stay there, and I'll watch. I'll say, and I'm, you immediately re I re immediately remember where I was you know, and what was going on in my life at that time, and if it was a hard day or not. And it's, it's fun to recall that. But then as I'm watching the scene, I'm saying, I hit that moment where I said, I could have done that better. And at that moment, I, I, I go on. And I'm just wondering, is it true with you? Oh, it's, it's, it, not obviously, not being an actor, I would imagine it's different, because if, I, you, if I'm kind of at a party or something, I can pick up the guitar and play one of my songs to, to whoever happens to be there. You can't just get up and act out one of your best scenes. Do you know what I mean? So the the, the gratification that you get, I don't know, can you? And what, what, what the gratification that you get off music, it self generates itself because you can do it over and over and over and over again. Whereas what, when you do a film, it's committed to celluloid, and then it's finished. Then it's done. And that's but it. You can but do does it, it make you feel bad that when you yeah. hear your <laughs> yeah. thing well, on the I, record well, and when then I you say, "Geez, I would have done it yeah. differently." Well, when I, when I listen to my music, I listen to it completely differently how other people I listen to every single instrument and know that oh, could have been better or that could have been better but well, you do the same thing yeah. Right? yeah but you know it's but, kind of but, but then we get to kind of perform it live night after night and the bits that you you, you think you could have done better you get to put right when you do it live kind of but when you look at a film like say Tootsie where you played a, yeah. a woman I mean uh, I mean where does that rate in your in your when you're retrospective, if you like, when you look at that, do you think, oh God, I wish I'd not done that or what? No, I like, I like, I like that. It's and a it, wonderful film. Thank you, thank mm. you. I like it. I mean, there's scenes that were written that were not shot because the director thought it was too racy or whatever. I wish he had shot them. There were other scenes that we did shoot that are not in the film, so that, of course, that exists. What was it yeah. like, though, becoming a woman? Well, I like what I learned. Uh, and I did learn stuff that I, that I never, and that's what you like when you do something, when you, I think whether it's whether you're composing, whatever, there's, there's something that comes into your consciousness that wasn't there before. And what I learned, because the, what made us want to write the thing in the first place was not what it's like to be a woman, but it's how would I have been different if I had been born a woman? Yes. My own personality. Yes. And well, if I would have looked like I looked as a man, it would have been very painful. So I asked them when we were working on the makeup, you know, make me look real. I don't want to do it unless I can walk down the street and people don't turn around and say, who's that guy in drag? I want it to be convincing. And then they, after months and months, they said, all right, you look convincing. I said, now make me beautiful. And they said, well, that's as good as it's going to get. <laughs> and that was, that was a moment, because at that moment, I realized if I'd met myself at a party, I wouldn't have gone near. <laughs> And that was painful, because I thought I was an interesting woman. And I realized I had missed out on a lot of interesting women, because I'd grown up with a kind of, you know, stereotypical... A stereotype, you know, right. So you, you made know. the judgment on how people looked, as we all do in, in yes, many, many ways, yes. of course. And then, and then I couldn't get the voice right as much as I tried. And one woman who was a speech therapist at, at a university in Los Angeles said a breakthrough thing to me, and she said, you know, it is a male dom. I mean, this is back in '82, so it's hopefully less so now. But it's a male-dominated society. So when men say things, they tend to 
and I'll tell you what you have to do. And then, blah, 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 and it ends there, but down. And he says, women, are, no matter what they're saying, they tend to ask permission to have an opinion. Well, what do you think about this? Well, you know, so everything ends up. Well, would it be all right if I, you know, and I thought, wow. And once I started doing that, it, it took me closer because it, it was, you know, they're, they're all, you know, at that time, they were asking for entrance, you know. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you're no, right about yes, that. Cause, no, yes. I mean, we, but women are. I mean, that's what women do, in, in the, that's, that's what they do in the house. They keep the the peace not by stomping and swearing, but by very cleverly manipulating, saying, "What do you think about this?" I mean, they're. That's how they do it. That's how my wife does it. <laughs> pure, pure evil. Pure evil. Yeah. I mean, they're very clever. You see, yeah. we're we're stupid. We're full of testosterone, bang on like that, and it doesn't work. Yeah, well, we, see, we're all up front about it. Yeah. Those lot are just... <laughs> Machiavellian, say the least, don't we? The puppet masters, I call them. The puppet masters. Yeah. Pulling all the strings. All the strings. <laughs> How long have you been married? 47, 8 years. Wow. I know. Wow. I've been married uh, 26. We've known each other for 30 years. And when I meet younger people, uh, sometimes they'll ask me, they're getting married, or whatever, they say, what's it like to... You know, do you have any advice for me? And I don't like to give advice, but I do give advice on marriage because I do think I found out something that was very, very important. What? I think on a fundamental level, if, if, a, if a relationship between a man and woman is going to last, I think on a, the only way it can last is on a fundamental level, I think the man has to be scared shitless <laughs> of it. <laughs> 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 it's absolutely true. Yeah, I mean, they're smarter and they're, yeah. as he says, I mean, they, they just, you cannot win an argument. <laughs> you know, and it's best not to spend yourself trying. That's, that's right. You know. um, I spent a great amount of my time petrified. Mm. <laughs> and, and we're working it out now. And, um, maybe when we've done 50 odd years, we'll, we'll come to some conclusion. Oh, that's wonderful. Speaking really. of which, so, uh, the last time that we talked, all those years ago, uh, you said that, that maybe toward, as you got older, you said, and you're coming up for your 70th birthday, so we can now ask you this question. Well done. Yeah, you look great. Well done. Fantastic. Uh, you, you said you'd like to do a, a film about two old people uh, in love. Mm. Yeah. So have you, have you got, are you going to further that plan? It's a nice idea. Well, you'll have to ask me in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I did read in the paper, though, and it warmed my heart, is uh, in, in New York there was a congressman who the, they said his career was ruined because his father was caught having sex with a woman in a parked car, and his father was 88, and I said, get him, go, go, get him, God bless you. I mean, yes, that's the guy I want to make a that's movie about. That's the start of the film, yes. all right. <laughs> well, all the best with, with Surges and Fiction, and, uh, and Thank you. good, great to have seen you, seen you again, and uh, hopefully it won't be another 30 years, because by God, we'll be all sods there, won't we? Yeah. Thank you. You, so, look, you look very, very well, sir. Dustin Thank Hoffman, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Old. Yeah, so I'm, I think that's why I'm a little out of breath. You know, it's been a while, you know. Yeah. Not been on tour for a year. And it went to, it went to number one in the... Yeah, in the it parade. did. And that's, Astounding. what, 35 years after your first number one. Yeah, 35 years. I've had four or five in between. Sure. But 1971 with Every Picture Tells a Story. Yeah. Good album. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's been 35 years and uh, 35 albums. And my girlfriend's 35. <laughs> 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 no, of course, and since, since last we met, uh, there's been another little Stuart has entered the world, Alistair. Yeah, bless him. Alistair Wallace Stuart. Ah, wonderful. Uh, he's not Scottish by any chance. <laughs> he's a li <laughs> little bit of Scottish blood and that's enough. Uh -huh. And last time we talked also too about you being at the birth and all that, and it being mm. a water birth. Yeah. Did, did you go through with all that? Yeah, we did. We, um, you know, we had the uh, bathtub all full and Penny was getting very close and doing the contractions and everything. And I said, right, it's time to get in the bath. So I sat behind her like thus. And she pushed and shoved and pushed and shoved. But unfortunately, after a couple of hours, 
Uh, the umbilical cord got stuck around Alice's neck, so we had to get her out of the bath, and we had a normal birth on the lino. <laughs> I was always born on the line, no, on the floor. Yeah. But it's funny when you've been in the water for two hours, everything shrinks. It? <laughs> Amazing, it goes white and sort of, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but you've been at, at the birth of all your children, haven't you, just then? Uh, apart from Sean, he, uh, my first boy, he's a, 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 a cesarean. A cesarean. Yeah. By the time I got me, me outfit on and my hat and my gloves and everything, I said, oh, congratulations, you've got a boy. <laughs> you know, so I, I missed him, otherwise all the others, yeah. And uh, eighth, uh, you know, in the market for an eighth child? I mean, I'll, I read that you're going to have the snip, actually. You're going no, to... that's a lot of bollocks. Was it? I tell you what happened. <laughs> I, was on a, I was on a TV show <laughs> in the States, and they tend to exaggerate what they hear in America here in the papers. What I actually said was, we're going to have one more, and then there'll be no more trains leaving the station. <laughs> but the press took it as, they, you know, E. Rod's going to close the line and have it snipped. So, there's no truth in that at all. No, I wouldn't have this old boy cut off again. <laughs> <laughs> Too much pleasure out there. <laughs> You're going to go for 11, then you a football team then. All right. Uh, I like the football pitch. It's, uh, it's... I mean, describe so this to me. I mean, I mean, I'd almost imagine it'd be like a sort of little training pitch. No, a seven it's, a, pitch. it's a... It's premiership uh, size, exactly, exactly the same size as Parkhead, Celtic's crown. Get in. It is. It's Get fabulous. You've got a pitch too, haven't you? I have. But mine's, uh, uh, oh, no, let me finish, same he's dimension. had his go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you know, Liverpool have trained on it, Newcastle have trained on it, Celtic have trained on it, a lot of the great teams have trained on it, so, and it's like a billiard table. No, you've got to come down, mate. Where's it? You know, in Epping, in Essex, it's not too far not away too from too far from where I am. Might do, one after do. Yeah, no, what, what about Sunday, right? mo Sunday morning, we've got a game Sunday morning. I'm, I'm, I'm good for about 15 minutes and then I just start vomiting. How old are you? <laughs> Me, I'm 39. Bollocks, it's over 40s. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can strike you in. That's terrible, that, isn't it? When you How, how's your pitch? It's, it, it's kind of growing over now. I, can't, well, I, I got mine and realised that mine was an eight-a-side pitch, and on, on the day it was finished, I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't remember 15 friends I'd play with, 15 male friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, so right. it was me, our kid. Well, that's about it, really, isn't it? <laughs> So I used, to, I used to just kick it around with the dogs on the, on the, on the, for hours on end. But, but you can't play, of course, can you, at present, because of your knees. Yeah, the knees have gone home, unfortunately. But I still like, you know, you know getting the games organised. My big brother organises the games. He's in the audience, and he's also the referee. <laughs> so he's a little bit <laughs> leaning towards our side, you know. <laughs> no, you I love it. The social thing on a sun, Sunday morning football is brilliant, you know. Why don't you buy yourself a football club? Got more sense. <laughs> all the money in the world now. I mean, what are you going to do with all that loot you've got? Oh, my kids are going through it very nicely, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've actually um, got shares in Celtic and so has my son, who was Gordon Strack and the manager bought some shares for Alistair, so that's about as far as I go. My heart's there, that's what counts. The, there were rumours that you were going to buy a football club, you, yeah. you and your brother. Yeah, but every time I go and see City now, and because they're rubbish, I was, was at Reading the other night, and you're walking out and they've been beaten, and all, all the fans are going, no, sort it out. And I'm like, look, I've got 200 quid on me, right? <laughs> I've got a decent pair of boots for somebody. That's your lot, you don't have anything else. <laughs> 200 quid would be a lot of Celtic Park, I tell you. <laughs> we could buy a new player. Well, we, but we were talking about Manchester City the other night, and the last time they won something was in the 70s, wasn't it? What was that called? Uh, it was called the League Cup. Now, don't laugh, they're a great team. And <laughs> the what? League Cup, I went to the party afterwards with Dennis Law. Oh, did you? Yeah. Right, I've got I'll see you later. Oh, no. That's all I was saying. <laughs> I've got Willie Donnicky's shirt from Willie Donnicky, really? He's one of your mods, isn't he? Dustin, yeah. would you like to come and sit here next Who's to me? Who's a goalkeeper? Corrigan. Ow! I told you, Corrigan was a goalkeeper. Come on, sit there. No, no, sit there. That'll be right. You sit there. Who's got to get the conversation now? Football's right. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, you got it. How do you get up there? Want me to pick you up on the way? Shall I fly over? I've got. Oh, look, we're going to do that. Nice, Mr. Hoffman. Let's all get up and do a dance. How about Dustin's socks, though? They're very good. They're excellent, eh? How about my jeans for a man of my age? Very good. Now, listen. What about you? Talking about your family there. What about this Russell Brand business? It was the GQ Awards, or yeah, it was the GQ Awards. He got on stage, and you insinuated. A little bit more stronger than that. He'd, he'd had it off with my daughter Kimberly, 27. Mm. And um, I love my kids, and they tell me everything. And she said, No, he didn't, Dad. You know, it was I got caught out in a photographic moment, and it looks that way, but I didn't. So when he got up on the stage, when I got up on the stage, I sort of, you know, pinpointed him. I said, Up, and 
God's honest truth, did you shag my daughter? Because it was a bit of a funny old night. And he said no. And he was humbled, you know. Absolutely humbled. Because you, you don't do that. Even in my heyday, I wouldn't have done that. I said he was frightened, wasn't he? He was a little, yeah, because I had a few of my mates in the crowd, like, didn't I? <laughs> he's, actually, he's, he's actually my pal, Russell, and he's very cheeky, but nothing else. He's a good boy. I say All that and his trousers in. I am, but very bad trousers at that. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a good lad. He's just very yeah, he was he's, 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 he's he, he, did, he did apologise. Yeah. What do you think about yeah. this, Dustin? I don't I'm know so why we mad. can't talk about knitting. That's right. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. You know, he, you, he started off wanting to be a musician, isn't that right? Yeah. You did? Yeah. And what happened to that ambition? I, I didn't have their talent. You didn't? Do you regret Full that? Full stop. Yeah, if God right now said, I could make you a good musician, but you'd never act again, I'd take it in a New York yeah, minute. That's my boy. No, and, no, and I, watch, I watch him do it, sing it, and it's just, it's glorious. It's lovely. I, I, and I think the, the marvelous thing about, about singing is that kind of physical thing of singing. Oh, too, my God. I mean, that, I, I that was so, got to be the biggest high of all. Yeah. Well, I was so yeah. envious of him, you know. I mean, what, I, I said, why, why can't it be like that for an actor? Why can't you ask me a question? And as I answer, I go like this. <laughs> Have you ever thought yourself of, of acting? Because one of your daughters is acting, isn't she? Yeah, she's sort of. Sort of. You know, she's not have you committed ever, to it. You've been you asked know. to act yourself, to, to play a part in a, in a movie, aren't you? Yeah, the only film I was asked to be in was a, uh, was a, um, a soccer movie that was about f soccer. Football movie about the Second World War with Sly Stallone. Oh, yeah, I think that... it was called Freedom, maybe. No, Escape to like, Victory. What was it called? Escape, Escape to, to Victory. victory. Yeah, right, yeah. And I was on tour and I couldn't okay. do it. That's the only one. Have you got no, no ambition to be an actor? No. Would you like to do it? No, Why is that? Because singing is what I do best, and I think you should stick to what you do best. So what's, what's the next thing for you? Then you've got uh, the album, promoting all that sort of stuff. But what's, what's after that? A tar, a start, tar, Touring. I start a tour on uh, yeah. January the 15th. It goes all through the States, and then I'm going to come here in the summer next year. Do you still enjoy touring? I do, yeah. I don't know. At the ripe old age of 61, I, I'm not great at being in the studio. I never have been right from day one, but give me a live audience, let me sing to them, and yeah. I, I'm you know, in seventh heaven. Yeah. Well, even, even with the faces, though, because when you listen to those faces records, it sounds like it was such a laugh in the studio. Well, it, it was, and huge amounts of alcohol were consumed. We used to leave it to, uh, you know, Ronnie Lane was the guy who, like, pulled everything. To me and Woody were just fringe men, really. We'd drink and strum and play, but Ronnie Lane was, was what you call the engine mm. of the group, you know. He pulled it all together. He managed to stay a little bit sober. Bless him. Right. He's on the roof now. <laughs> yeah. Well, Rod Stewart, uh, all the best with the album. Thanks, I bro. don't need to say that, actually, it's a bloody good album, and it's, uh, it's uh, doing very well thank indeed. Thank you. And uh, thank you for being my guest. Good to see you again. Thank you. Mr. Rod Stewart. <laughs> My thanks to Rod Stewart, to Dustin Hoffman and to Noel Gallagher from all of us here. A very good night. Good night. <laughs>